Hey, this is Paul Bands with GreatDad.com, the website for fathers, because dads don't always think like moms. And if you're just tuning in, Great Dad Talks is a series of weekly conversations with new and expert fathers, all with a point of view on modern parenting. And I'm, you know, I'm a life coach and I talk to dads all the time. And I'm just always fascinated by what everyday dads have to say about fatherhood as it evolves, but also getting experts who are, you know, in our in our time, in our in our world, who have kids of their own is uh, is is also uh, just fascinating because it adds a little bit of uh, of uh, of the of the research and the knowledge behind some of the things that some you know some of which comes naturally to us some of us that we're just guessing at every day. So today I'm really excited to talk to uh, to Chris Thurber. He's a uh, a PhD psychologist and he and his co-author Hank Weisinger have writ- written a book on the unlikely art of parental pressure. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So this is just this is just a conversation that I think is so important to, to have. And you and I talked a little bit before about the the fact that I think most parents sense that there's something in between between helicopter parenting and completely ignoring their child. And so I just I'd love to hear first of all what you think of this idea of of parent. You know, it's, you, as you say, it's an art. <laughs> which you know puts it in a different category than some other things how how, how do we navigate this parental pressure yeah uh, well yeah. first i mean i i think that it's great if parents are thinking about i don't want to be stifling on the one hand i don't want to be neglectful on the other hand so uh what's the happy medium and i think uh baumann's research for example is a great way to think about parenting styles and mm-hmm. lying along the dimensions of warmth and how much control you are exerting and and that obviously changes ac- across you know a child's developmental trajectory you may always be warm but you may want to exert more control in one domain especially when your child is younger and give them some developmentally appropriate freedom so i think it's wonderful that parents are thinking flexibly about how they interact with their kids and what's healthy for them what hank and i propose in the book, based on the research that we've done, we're wanting parents to, first of all, recognize that there is no way to avoid applying pressure. If you love your child, you want what's best for them. And everyone, of course, is different personality. And this interactive dance between a parent and a child is unique in every family. But one thing that I would say is common to all loving parents is they want what's best for their child. And that means that you will apply some pressure. So we didn't want people to think about pressure as something bad. We wanted them first to recognize that it's instinctive and then to really reframe the question because for a couple hundred years, I think we've been asking how much pressure is enough, how much is not enough. And that's where I think a quantitative question isn't helpful. I think it's much more about what kind of pressure you're exerting rather than how much. Um, and I, I, I can say more about that, but that 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 would be my answer to your first question. Yeah, because I think right now, especially you know through the pandemic and before the pandemic, we are all really a lot of parents are very worried about how much pressure their kids are under it. And we, we've had yeah. to talk about the fact that America is, is falling behind in some certain, like some, some STEM disciplines, other, there are other cultures who put far more pressure on. And then we have a segment of parents in America who are saying no less pressure, no homework, not, not, you know, <laughs> let's not take, let's take away all most of the pressure and let them be kids while they have this magical time. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's any, probably you and I can't define what that perfect level you know, at 100 is for what the pressure is. But is there anything that you've learned learned about or talked about in terms of what that, you know, how, how kids thrive best? I mean, I think you're saying that a certain amount of pressure is important. Yes. So I think, as you said, in your in your opening comment, the the title of the book, The Unlikely Art of Parental Pressure, has a couple of funny words in there. It's suggesting that it's an art means, wow, there might not be some kind of exact scientific recipe or model for us to follow. And that is true just because every kid is different and has their idiosyncrasies as as do every, you know, as does every parent. 
the unlikely part is what you just said. It's paradoxical to think about pressure as something that you can't not apply. But we were really shocked when we looked at the research on the specific kind of parental pressure that is harmful to kids. And I'll give you some specific examples. One study in the last 10 years that was conducted at a university and looked at hundreds of students from first year students to fourth year students discovered that 19.4%, almost one in five students had thought about suicide as a consequence of feeling they had not met their parents' expectations for grades and endorsing a lot of grade-based pressure. So again, loving well-intentioned parents who might say something like, you know, we're not going to pay this outrageous tuition to have you <laughs> drink beer and get C's, you know, which look, uh, you know, I'm as of 10 days ago, also a parent of a college student, and I don't want to have my child waste their time. No parent would. But let's unpack that statement. You know, I'm not going to pay all this money to have you get C's or something. What really we're saying is we don't want you to waste your time. We believe in your potential, but the way it comes out really specifies a particular outcome, you know, like C grades or B grades or A grades. And that's where I think we stumble over ourselves as parents. I think maybe dads, especially in painting this with a broad brush, we tend to be maybe more focused on kind of quantitative, Objective. specific sorts of outcomes as a, maybe a little bit more concrete. And what Hank and I say in the book is, boy, it's, it's better if what you're doing is encouraging your child to be their best, not the best. Or it's better to encourage and praise effort rather than outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, who doesn't want a good outcome? Who doesn't want top grades? It's not about saying, I don't care about your grades, but instead saying, like, if you got a few Bs and a few Cs this term because you took some of the hardest classes that you could and you're moving from you know, sociology major to electrical engineering, uh, as long as you're doing your best, I'm thrilled, you know, like, and you should be really gratified right. too. So and that's a life lesson too. I mean, not, not, right? all, not all of us can win Nobel prizes. And if exactly. we don't have that as our objective a standard of yeah. success, we're all doomed. Yes. And precisely. And we can all remember a moment where it looks like somebody just performed so well in a in a clutch situation you know the last few seconds of the nba finals game seven and somebody you know sinks a three-pointer in the last second to win the game and those are flashbulb memories those are those are awesome except if you look at this scientifically here's the non-art part of it most of the time in high pressure situations, when the outcome is very narrowly defined and it all rests on peak performance from you, your your you know, your performance is gonna be worse. Even the best athletes perform at average or below average, you know, full count, bottom of the ninth. If you if you run the statistics, this is very much of a sort of a money ball situation, <laughs> you know the best hitters are hitting in those circumstances at their it's average or below. Last at bat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yes, there are such things in life as clutch plays, but most of the time high pressure is a, a, a decrement to performance and to mental health. So what I really want dads to be invested in moms as well is the recognition that Pressure is normal. It's instinctive. There's a difference between healthy and unhealthy pressure. And even though you can remember clutch plays, what you also need to remember is those are the exceptions, not the rule. We want to bring unhealthy pressure down. And rather than communicating a very narrow outcome, like you got to make this much money to be successful, or you got to go to this school to be successful, instead of having a narrow definition of what a successful outcome is, 
broaden it. And instead of saying that, you know, it all depends on you, focus on what your child is passionate about and what they want to explore. Because at the end of the day, and this is a little, I guess, macabre to say, but we're not going to be around. Uh, you know, most children outlive most parents. So if you think that what you have to do is really hammer on your kid to get them to perform, what happens when you're not there? Right? They've got to have intrinsic motivation. So I, I, re- I think it's real. Uh, one thing that's really important about what you said is about, about the fact that the things that we talk about and the things we talk about using the back to the sports analogy are the outlier effects. Yeah. And what is natural for parents to talk about is, uh, did you hear about Susie and and John? Their daughter just got into Harvard. Did you talk? To, you know, did you talk to Bill and and Sherry? And they, you know, their their child just won a the the, the prize in STEM or whatever. And the um, I, a question for you is is how do you, you know it's 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 only natural for us to talk about other families that we know and their kids mm-hmm. and their successes. That I don't think there's anything wrong intrinsically about that. But how do we talk about those situations, those achievements of other people without it sounding like why aren't you why aren't you living up to that other family's standards or uh, is there a way that we can still talk to our kids about other people's achievements that's maybe perhaps even inspiring, but it's, at the very least, it's not detrimental or destructive. Yes, absolutely. Um, Paul, I think two things that I hope all dads and moms do from a very early age, and, and not too late to start this if your children are adolescents, but one is, again, focusing on effort more than outcome. I think it's so helpful when parents can ask their kids at a very young age, when those kids are in awe of something. You take your child to the circus and somebody's doing backflips. You take them to a minor league baseball game and somebody is hitting home runs over the fence. It could be a peer, it could be a professional, but you see that they're saucer eyed. That's the time to ask them, what do you think it took for that person to learn how to do that? That's awesome. That's really cool that they can hit the ball that far. That's incredible that they can do a somersault off the diving board and, you know, not belly flop, you know, (laughs) but getting them to reflect on, you know, it, it, it's not just that they were, you know, born like that or that it sprung out of thin air, but it took time. It took work. Um, even, you know, a lot of our kids and teenagers have favorite groups, uh, musical groups. Uh, what do you think it took for this musician to become famous? You know, what What do you think it took? And that's a place, w- especially with musicians, I think at le- a lot of teenagers that I speak with at Phillips Exeter Academy here are sm- smitten, maybe too strong a word, but they one of the reasons they like an artist, especially a musical artist, is they know their backstory. You know, they they came from some hard scrabble background and put forth a lot of effort, combine that with their creativity and you know, led to something wonderful. And that would be one thing is talk to kids about the process so that later on when you say, oh, wow, you know, wasn't it, did you hear that Susie won uh, the math Olympiad? they're not going to feel jealous. They're going to be thinking about how does someone get to that point, you know? And, and I think the other piece that goes hand in hand with that is modeling for them this kind of appropriate admiration for somebody else's accomplishments, uh, Mm. rather than saying, you know, did you hear that Susie won the math Olympiad, you know, that, that could have been you, if you, you know, (laughs) if you played less, you know, Xbox, that could have been you. Um, That sort of guilt inducing comment isn't motivating at all. And I understand, of course, why parents would say something like that. But when we model for our kids appropriate admiration, I think we say things like, you know, did you did you hear that Susie won the math Olympiad? I I think that's such a remarkable accomplishment. I'm so I'm so happy for her that she is passionate about math and and really, you know, disciplined enough to to really 
focus on the preparation for such a extraordinary event. And, you know, I hope that at that point, one is able to, you know, parents are able to turn to their kids and say, you know, it makes me feel really good to see how passionate you are about baseball or about drawing or about writing or, you know, sometimes I, I, I look at the way you, um, you know, joke around with your friends and I realize what a quick wit you have and what a passion you have for what is essentially stand up comedy, but boy, you make other people feel so good when you can joke about yourself and you can joke about things that might even make them feel uncomfortable. So it doesn't matter what it is that we're, I think it doesn't matter what it is that we're praising and recognizing, but that's, that's where I think we're able to recognize other kids accomplishments and, and really align our kids with that greatness by citing the effort and by expressing our joy and then moving the conversation to, you know, what is it, Paul, that lights you up inside, you know? No. And then different people find these things at different times. Yeah, I, I, back to what you said, the effort rather than the outcome, rather than celebrating the A, celebrating midway through the semester of, I know you worked really hard all weekend or and it really shows, or I could I can tell in this paper yeah, you just, you know, you not only is it great, but you really, you really worked. You did, it wasn't, it wasn't magic. You worked to get to that, that great. Yeah. So then I guess a corollary question is that they, they get so much, um, they get so much intrinsic or to, not intrinsic, but um, implied pressure. And quite often, mm -hmm. quite often parents think that they can say, well, you know, it's not that I, uh, you know, it's not that you have to go to Harvard or you don't want to, you, uh, that we, you know, we really want you to go to Harvard, um, but something else is okay too. Or I, well, I guess well, maybe I'm saying this wrong, wrong but the, that they, that you can say as a parent, I don't really care what you do, or I don't really care what your grades are. But then they're hearing all these other messages that are that are so achievement oriented. So they're getting this mixed thing. And you think you've covered your bases by as a parent by saying, you know, you could be an artist. So that's okay with me. I'll still love you. But all the <laughs> other messages, all the other examples they're getting during the day are if you don't go to Harvard, yeah, you maybe you can, yeah, could have been better. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I think part of it is if part of it is for parents to pay attention to the way they deliver that fr that sentence you know uh look i'm still gonna love you no matter where you go i'd be perfectly happy like even if you went to unh <laughs> right and it's like wait a second that you know that really didn't come out the way you intended it to, to come out because you're still disparaging what could be a wonderful option for them so that would be you know the first piece of guidance and then the second is you're right absolutely to point this out there are harmful pressures that young people experience from all different domains parents are uniquely influential which is why hank and i wrote this book with parents as the audience plus parents are people and people have to read books you can't write a book dear culture and have the culture change. but parents as as you suggested can be these wonderful buffers for some of the unhealthy cultural pressures that kids feel. And I, I, I think dads are in a unique position to do this because still the way that boys and men are socialized, they aren't often, and again, I'm painting this with a broad brush, but they aren't as able sometimes to find the words to discuss, uh, to describe how they're feeling or what they're thinking. They, they may, feel that expression of negative emotion equates to weakness, which of course it doesn't. And that creates a whole nother layer to the unhealthy pressure that I think kids can feel. So the antidote really is to have conversations with your kids about at least your perception of some of these cultural pressures, whether it's a pressure to wear a certain brand of clothes or a pressure to be heterosexual or a pressure to watch certain TV shows or play certain video games, a pressure to um, 
have a certain phone. So visible material kinds of things provide a lot of harmful pressure and suggest that you know, to be happy and successful, you need to look a certain way or you need to possess a certain thing. I also think some of the subtle examples that Hank and I give in the book, like um, I overheard a parent just two summers ago, the summer of 2020, when I was really writing this book intensively, describe Bill Gates as someone who's worth, now I have to make up the figure because I don't remember, he's worth $3 billion. And I thought, what an odd way to describe somebody's worth in terms of money. And I, I know what that expression means. If he were to liquidate all his assets, you'd get $3 million. Okay. But is really that the best way to say it, that someone is worth this money, this amount of money? I think about you know, whatever people think of Microsoft, Bill and Melinda Gates having given so much money to eradicate malaria and do important research and make computers available to kids. If we can talk about the things that other people do in a way that's congruent with our values, then I think we're doing our kids a huge favor and buffering them from the unhealthy cultural pressures that exist. Well, there are many, many things, many, many wise things you said in that uh, in that uh, part. Uh, not the least of which is is having these kind of conversations with your kids ongoing, so it isn't so much uh, random comments about other people's uh, other people's right. children or other people's successes, and having them the, the conversations be a lot more a lot more nuanced that get to. Uh, uh, shared values, family values, the values that that you that you're trying to transmit to them, asking them questions about other reactions of things rather than making a pronouncement on the on mm -hmm, the value mm -hmm. of what you know the Nike shoes or whatever they have, rather than saying why are you wasting your money on that junk, saying why is it important to you to spend uh, you know two hundred fifty dollars of your allowance on that particular shoes when you could be buying a generic brand at the discount place for half of that and they'd be fine. Is, do, you, do you think have you thought th thought this through? And sometimes kids just haven't thought it through and then they come, right. to, a, come to a decision and sometimes they, they then still say, Hey, but I still want to spend the money, but then they at least have, I mean, there are many, many kind of part of the many conversations like that you can have with your kids. Uh, I don't, I don't yes. think ever stop uh, suggesting to parents that try to have more of those. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. And I love the way that you framed it in your sample conversations. It's, it's, it's a non-judgmental stance. Yeah. And I think that's so important if ultimately our goal is for our kids to be able to weather some of the unhealthy pressure that they're feeling to make measured decisions that take other people's feelings into consideration. We need to, we need to not presume from the outset that for example, you know, we're gonna have this conversation, but I'm just gonna tell you at the beginning, you're not getting those Nike sneakers or, <laughs> or, or, or even well, you shouldn't get those Nike sneakers because that, right. It's a non-starter. Yeah. Your kids aren't going to listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just went through this with my, with my son who decided he wanted to get his ears pierced. And uh, I, I don't think I did. I was not at a, at a hundred percent of playing, playing it right. I mean, he's still got a feeling for the fact that I didn't, didn't think that was a great idea, but uh, you know, we did, we did have a, a more of an adult conversation of why it was important to him, what he wanted to get out of it, what he thought his responsibilities were, why he thought it was, why it was, he thought he had just as much of a right to get his ears pierced and have me pay for it as for his sister, which was <laughs> correct in, in saying that there was an inequality there and he demanded they get equal yeah. treatment. So I think those things can bring up interesting perspectives and kids are, kids are sometimes a lot smarter than you think they are, especially when you force them to argue yeah. for their, their position. Uh, so yeah. I wanted to uh, yeah. ask you if you could, you know, I, you, I don't want to give, have you give the book away. So a good reason to go out and buy the unlikely out of parental pressure. But if you could maybe take us through you know, four or five things that you think are, are concepts or tips that people could keep in mind as they think about how to, you know, navigate this, this pressure filled world. Absolutely. So the first few, I'll summarize a little bit, some of the things that I've said, but begin by recognizing that it's instinctive and natural to apply pressure and that you don't need to lower your standards. In fact, 
our approach is going to lead to better mental health for your child and better performance because you're going to dial down the amount of unhealthy pressure and dial up the amount of healthy pressure. The second would be recognizing that the best judge of whether pressure is comfortable or uncomfortable and in, 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 in that way healthy or unhealthy is the child. And we sometimes conflate asking our child, you know, so, you know, how is this feeling to you that I'm, you know, I'm sharing with you some of the pros and cons of getting your ears pierced, but also sharing with you my, my opinion. What, what, like what's going on right now for you inside? What are you thinking? You know, what are you feeling? I think we benefit so much from checking in with our kids about how our parenting is coming across. Parents will sometimes say, I think dads especially, like, wait a minute, you know, like, Chris, you had me until then, because now it's, you just, you just got too sort of touchy feely and I am not relinquishing control to my child. You don't know my kid. I am not, somebody has got to be in charge in my house. I'm like, no, no, I never said you have to do what your child is asking you to do. And I never said, if they don't like what you're doing, you should do something different. I make decisions all the time that my kids protest, you know, uh, if I, only let them do what they wanted to do or i acquiesced to their protest to like hey you gotta vacuum the downstairs or you gotta clean up your room before your friends come over and, uh, you know if at that moment i said like oh sorry was my request did that hurt your feelings or were you annoyed by that or like forget that no so it's not that their reaction or their feedback needs to change anything but if you want to be the best dad possible, don't you want good data? Don't you, don't you want to know? Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that I'm sure you've seen, Paul, where Calvin comes up to his dad and says, you know, dad, uh, it's something like, I've just collected some, some rankings and your popularity is at an all-time low, you know, <laughs> which is wonderfully coercive of Calvin's, one of my like <laughs> favorite cartoon characters ever. But it's you know being being a really good loving parent is not a popularity contest, uh, it, you no. know, as any parent well, he, will tell you. So it is a lot like uh, forward relations. I think uh, there's a combination yeah. of hard power and soft power, and you can use the hard power all the time, but. The relationship you have is not is going to be less efficient and less effective over time unless you can complete you can continuously apply more and more hard pressure. And as you say, there's a point where you're right. no longer in the picture. And when that hard pressure goes, what you know, what happens then? So, uh, yeah, that's a great way to summarize it. Um, so I think another sort of concrete tip that I would share is think about the praise that you offer your child and what exactly you are praising or what the message is. And this relates to getting feedback from your kids about how your parenting feels. Um, the best example I can give you is that both of my boys play the violin and we, my wife and I would often, if they would have once a year or every 18 months a solo recital, in line with what is a, I think a cultural tradition, offer them a bouquet of flowers at the end of the concert. However, they did. And what was interesting, and I was so smug about this, Paul, because a couple of other dads came up to me at different times when the boys were younger and said, Chris, I just think it's so great that you gave Dacha or Sava, my boys' names, um, you know, a bouquet of flowers at the end of the concert. I, just because they're boys and I, I, you know, I'm thinking that's more traditional for girls and I just feel like you're such a progressive dad. And I thought like, oh, I'm doing it all right, you know? <laughs> and then, then I, uh, I started thinking, Paul, about what Simo and I were doing, which is, you know, we really worked as hard as we could to not apply unhealthy pressure to get the boys to practice violin. And 
we were blessed that they had a lot of intrinsic motivation for this, especially maybe after their first recitals when they were little, realizing, oh, you know, people enjoy this. I can bring joy to other people. So I'm going to, you know, sometimes it's a sacrifice and a trade-off to practice, but what an awesome payoff. Okay. But we wanted to keep giving flowers. I just realized we should be giving these flowers about an hour before he goes on stage because we're, what we're really wanting to praise and reinforce is the perseverance it took to get to this yeah, moment. Yeah, so we did that the next time. Yes. And, and Simo said, my wife said to me, well, we would never not give Dacha flowers if the performance wasn't perfect. And I said, I agree, but I think what, message we want to be sending should emphasize his hard work and dedication he's going to get lots of praise in the form of applause and people again regardless of how he plays showing that appreciation let us show appreciation for just and people the audience will still see the flowers if people hang around for a you know cup of coffee or you know some chips and soda after the concert, which you know the, the boys always wanted. But that's an example of what Hank and I try to do in the book, which is reassure parents that we want you to uphold these same high standards. We think there are some adjustments you can make to some of the ways you parent that will send just the message you want without applying unhealthy pressure. And I don't think Dacha ever wondered, will I still get flowers if I don't perform well? But because of the timing of when we did that, it could have been some of the subtext. Yep. So, you know, I think another thing too, another practical tip, you and I talked a little bit about this before the show is the importance of empathy. And it's so much more common for moms, at least according to the research, to ask, and other female care caregivers, aunts, grandmothers, to ask little kids questions about their emotions and other people's emotions. So you're pushing the shopping cart down the aisle and notice another family where the kid is really having a tough time, one of those knockdown, drag out temper tantrums or something like that. It's much more common for a mother or a female identifying caregiver to say, wow, that, you know, that little boy looks really upset. I wonder what's, I wonder what's on his mind, or I wonder what, you know, that, that daddy and that boy are arguing about or something. And just by inviting women more frequently inviting their children, especially their daughters into conversations about other people's thoughts and feelings, uh, and, and and not doing it so much with their male identifying children and fathers doing it the least of all, we're, we're in a sense, we're handicapping our boys. Now, lots and lots of exceptions. And if some of your viewers and listeners are thinking, well, no, I actually talk to my daughter, my son, my child about their thoughts and feelings and other people's thoughts and feelings, or we're watching a movie and we you know, we talk about the thoughts and feelings of the characters, I would say, you know, bravo. If not, well, there are lots of opportunities for dads, especially, and you don't need any answers. You just need to remember to ask the question about, I wonder how that kid is feeling, or you're watching, you know, boy, the European, you know, soccer championship, which ended as you probably remember in this penalty kick shootout, talk about a high pressure situation where you need individual peak performance with a very narrow outcome. And I was listening to it on the radio and there were two commentators and one of them when Italy won was just couldn't contain himself and it was very celebratory. And the other commentator was silent and after about 45 minutes or 45 seconds of the other commentator just being so ebullient, the first commentator said, I'm looking at the goalkeeper for the UK and he is devastated. He is being comforted right now by the coach. And I thought, oh, good. Like, here's a, th this is both commentators are men. All the players wow. are men. And I'm glad that even in this championship moment, it is this conversation that's balanced 
with some celebration and just a little bit of, wow, that there's one person here on the field who's in a lot of emotional pain. I thought, okay, well, this is 2021. That's good. Well, um, they usually like to play up that part. That's part of the drama of sports too, is the, right, right. Is it the agony of Victor or the something of victory and the agony? Oh yeah. Of, uh, the, yeah. The agony of defeat, right? <laughs> yeah. The thrill of victory and the agony yeah, right. of defeat, but all the dads who are listening now who are sports fans, you know, and like to watch sports with their kids, keep doing it and occasionally ask them, yeah, I wonder what that right fielder felt like to throw a perfect throw into home plate so that the catcher could tag that guy out. Or I wonder what that right fielder felt like to drop the ball. And again, you don't need an answer, but those are cool conversations to have that really instill a better understanding of other people's thoughts and feelings and make it more likely that your child is going to be able to, you know, empathize. And well, yeah, we certainly, we talk so much in the modern culture about emotional, uh, emotional IQ, EQ, as they, as they call it, it's a, it's a really a treasured uh, skill in yeah. business today. And a lot of people just don't possess it. And in my talking with a lot of men, uh, a lot of dads, uh, when they're, when they're discussing issues with the family, a lot of them don't even have the vocabulary to be able to identify different emotions. So I, I would really challenge all, all dads who are interested in strong relationships with their kids to try to try to use those words with your kids so you can understand yourself because it's empathy is one of the in coaching. We really talk about empathy as one of being one of the, the greatest powers of both uh, being able to understand the other person, but also to give your own self a break and realize that you can't always mm -hmm. achieve uh, perfection either. So true. And I, I, I say to, you know, in the talks that I give at schools and, you know, companies, the power of empathy is in the pause. Mm. We contaminate empathy often with rejoinders, disclaimers, and solutions. So say, <laughs> oh, Paul, you know, Paul, you sound really upset, but it, 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 it really, means that you have to take this big project and break it into small pieces <laughs> or, you know, uh, Paul, I can tell you're disappointed. You forgot to press record. We'll just have to do it again. You know, it, and the wonderful empathic statement that contains this adjective that describes a thought or a feeling like upset or disappointed gets lost in the haze of the minimization or whatever you say afterwards. So much better to say, oh, I can tell you're really disappointed. And let the other person just sit with that before you offer a solution, before you offer, ah, I, I think one of the things that I hear from students all the time is about the end of a romance and their parents' commentary on that. Mm. Um, you know, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it was a shock to get that text from that boy or that girl or that other student and have them break up with you over text. It's so abrupt. It's so not classy, but you know, you guys weren't a great match anyway. And yeah. you know, it's like, wait a second, somewhere in there was the <laughs> adjective upset, but then you got a little social commentary and then you sort of said it wasn't a good relationship anyway. And you never gave the person a chance to connect with you emotionally. Let it just sit. You know, I can, ah, I can hear in your voice how upset you are. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, Full you, stop. That, that there isn't some value in that contextualization or that description or either, or the to do, but that, that pause I think is important. And that pause might not be five minutes. It yeah. might be a day <laughs> or a week. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and then, is, you know, well, knowing that uh, as part of the, so important, your, your unlikely art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and like you say, it can be a, a long pause, um, a day or more. But, uh, you know, I guess the fifth kind of tip I would offer is related to what you just said, and that is give your kids an age appropriate amount of agency. And, you know, when you say to them, well, look, you know, you just need to delete those social media apps and forget about this person. And that's not healthy pressure to be imposing your will in that way. It's certainly not going to generate the kind of independence that I think most parents are ho hoping is the end result of good parenting. But to instead, like you said, parents have experience. They have lots of good ideas. And it may be appropriate to share those, but think about the difference between 
telling your child what they need to do versus asking them, so do you like, do you want some help thinking about this or, you know, do you want to brainstorm some solutions or do you think you pretty much have this one, you know, thought through whatever whatever it is you know feeling overwhelmed by lots of homework feeling sad because you were just uh, dumped um asking and i do it as a therapist too you know do you want some help thinking about that and a lot of times kids will surprise me but as you said they it, they surprise us by our wis their wisdom they'll say now dr thurber i really like i i know what i need to do i think i just really need to get it off my chest yeah awesome you know, yeah. And then they can come back if there's something else after they say exactly. Down. Yeah, we've put the offer on the table. Yeah, well, Chris, those are five really helpful things. I, there's some really good common sense in there, but I think it's also good to jog the jog the thinking and uh, realize uh, some of the things that you 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 can do and mm. as a as a parent. Before I let you go, I I do want to ask you about uh, about pressure that parents put on their kids at an early age that a lot of parents, me included, think that it was, was important because they were developing skills that they couldn't develop at a later age. And you, you, you were lucky you had two violinists who, who, who jumped into the, jumped into the, into the, the discipline. I, I have two children who play the piano. Um, my son uh, now blames me for the fact that I ruined piano for him, even though he went on to play piano and then went out to play his guitar and bass and is playing in his you know band. It's like three bands at school and he has a love for love for music and appreciation of music. But that yeah. that feeling that, you know, there are certain things that you if you don't catch them at the right age, that they they'll they'll never get it. Uh, they'll never get back. I actually resent yeah. my parents for not forcing me to play the piano or play a musical mm. instrument. So it can go the other way too. But how do you, how do you regulate that, you know, that need to establish something like that um, at an early age versus forcing them to do something unpleasant, ongoing, you know, under pressure? Oh, it's a great question. Well, first I think you got to do a little bit of a gut check. Am I pressuring my kid to do this? because it's an unfulfilled wish or <laughs> yes, fantasy that, of my, mine. You I'll know? take the point for that one. Yeah, and, and I think we all have as parents things that we secretly want our kids to do because yeah. we weren't quite able to Pee-wee accomplish those things or, ourselves. Pee-wee hot. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, you know, if that's the case, I would dial it back a little bit and realize, you know, it's not your child's job to fulfill your unmet needs, just recognize, okay, we none of us achieve everything that we want to in life and certainly not when we're young, but we need to prioritize what our child's, you know, interests are or we're not or and what is going to be, you know, culturally relevant. So I don't know, if we're living in well, my wife is from Serbia and so she was brought up speaking Serbo-Croatian, her parents also, like most parents in Serbia, also insisted that she take English in school and and that's available in the public school system from a, you know, from kindergarten because Serbia is a fairly small country relative to other countries and outside of Serbia and Croatia and maybe Southern Slovenia and parts of Montenegro and, uh, you're not going to be able to speak server creation. You need to speak some other language. So learn German or learn English or something. So I recognize that there are functional advantages to putting some pressure on our kids that will capitalize on the age they're at and the ease of learning. As you said, we don't want to pass this, you know, opportunity we have when they're younger to have them learn a musical instrument or another language. So once you've realized, okay, this isn't for me, it's for them. Then I think the next thing is, you know, is it important culturally? Is it important functionally? Uh, And if the answer is yes, and that has you still deciding, yeah, I really want to, you know, encourage them to do this, set it up in a way that is enjoyable, that is sociable. 
you know, my kids started learning violin with the Suzuki method, which has just about as much group work as it has individual work. And the fact that they never felt lonely, they never felt like they were the only kids who were learning violin. Another beautiful thing about the design of that method is you you start performing right away, uh, not a year later, because kids are four. They're not, what is a year when you're four? It's That's an eternity. Um, but they're getting some positive reinforcement for genuine accomplishment. It's just you want to have them realize some early successes. And I think that makes it, you know, that makes it so, that helps build a lot of good momentum, right? And I understand, yeah, I've never met your son, but I understand because I've heard other young people say, oh, you know, you know, like force me to play the piano, dad, you kind of wrecked the piano for me. To which I would say, maybe your memories of practicing the piano disincline you to play now, but your musical education is something that you definitely still enjoy and your sense of meter and rhythm and being able to read music and listen to other players so you can play in a band like thanks very much i helped you with that you know i mean <laughs> thanks for let, letting me off the hook Chris. really right <laughs> it, true a and also and i can you know you and i both have a sense of humor about all of these things uh, i think it's sort of the death knell of parenting if we take ourselves too seriously and can't joke about it with other parents can't joke around about it with other kids i mean times when i've gotten so upset and gone back to my kids you know an hour later and said, well, I just like, dad kind of lost it there. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, that was pretty good one. You know? <laughs> no, I think you that's important. You have I, to be able to do that. You have to be able to apologize to your kids and, and show yeah. availability, I think. Well, I just, right. And even really, so, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, even for you to say, look, I, I'm sorry if what I said or did really soured you to the piano, but, um, I did what I thought was best and I am, so gratified to see that if not the piano the guitar and other things and that music is something that does bring you joy that that makes me feel like i got part of that right <laughs> you know and yeah, we, yeah we'll take we'll take the w's when we can get them <laughs> yeah that's right that's right well i think i think that also you know part of the the through line through a lot of this conversation is also meeting you know meeting them where they are as a, as the saying goes and the fact that they they're constantly changing you're constantly changing this culture is constantly changing and it's this is not a static function uh, 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 working with fathers is uh, uh, just really brings home the point that all all these kids are different and the the challenges are different at every different age and you got to just really have a yeah an open ear and be listening to that evolution and changing your you know, the way you interact with them as they evolve and. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been a real pleasure uh, chatting with you and getting, uh, getting these five tips. The book is the unlikely art of uh, parental pressure. And I take it that's out, uh, out now available now. Yes. Uh, Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble.com, hopefully your local bookseller. So um, check it out. And your, and your co-author is uh, Dr. Hank Weisinger. On both of your PhDs, yes, who did, did this research. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, for those of you, oh, my uh, pleasure. My uh, coaching services, I work on, uh, I work with dads all the time, uh, specializing quite often in uh, divorced fathers, stay-at-home fathers. Uh, most recently, a lot of older fathers making the transition to empty nesters. And I always invite uh, uh, interaction on our website, greatdad.com/coaching. Okay, until next week. See you.